rejoice that we have the faithfulness of God. He has always been faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to him. When we continue our sins of thoughts, words, and deeds, God is gracious and merciful to us and reminds us that he has covered our sins with the blood of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so I invite us this morning to kneel or to sit for our time of confession and absolution as a people of God this morning. Because of the faithfulness of God, we may be able to kneel this morning and know that God's mercies are sufficient for us. My brothers and sisters and fellow saints, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We join our hearts together, saints, this morning. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thoughts, word, and deed. We have sinned against you in things we have done and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. My brothers and sisters and fellow saints, we know that our God is always merciful and gracious to us. Amen. And our God is always granted forgiveness through Jesus Christ to all who confess their sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his full authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Saints, this morning in our prayers, as we come before the Lord, we, we lift up three families in our church. The family of Daryl Gardner. We're still waiting to get a homegoing celebration together for him. We pray for their internal conflict. We pray, of course, uh, for our, the Bledsoe family. Angela, we love you. We know God is with you as you're mourning and grieving. Your mother was called home at age 105, and, and we want to celebrate that on November the 3rd and worship on that day. And then we also, of course, lift up the family, uh, Joyce Whitaker's family. As you can tell, we had a beautiful home going celebration yesterday for her. And the family has left the flowers for the members of the church to take home with them, the fresh flowers to take home with them uh, today, and they send their love. We had um, a couple hundred people sitting in church yesterday. Uh, we probably fed about 175 people after church yesterday. It was a beautiful day for us to share the good news of the gospel, have a testimony of faith about a woman who said so faithfully, you're not going to believe this, Kim. She sat right here in this seat. Yeah. Yeah. And this was her seat. Isn't that something? Glad and, I didn't take it. And, well, you took it this morning. God filled you in that seat this morning with her, Kim. What a blessing. So we pray for those three families as they continue to grieve and to mourn. We also want to pray for our vicar. God has brought us uh, vicar Jean Enoch Burris. Uh, since I first met him in the midst of the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 to today, a miracle has continued to happen in his life, and we are, we are blessed to be a part of his spiritual formation, and we want to commission him this morning and he, as he then continues and kind of kicks off his next four to five year journey as a vicar in our church and in our city. Amen. We also want to lift up other individuals who are asking for prayer this morning. We saw Don Lee Phillips at worship yesterday, and all he did was hold my hand and say, Pastor, keep praying. Tell the saints to keep praying for me, so I want to do that for you as well. We also want to praise and thank God. Your sister's doing better, 
and uh, she's healing up and she's getting ready for her prosthetics there. And we tell her we're praying for her, Gene, if you would. We also want to continue to lift up uh, Ada. Uh, Elise, you're here this morning. How's Aunt Ada? Is she all right? You guys were out last week. She's doing better now. All right, to God be the glory. I'm glad that is the case. We lifted you all up. What a blessing. Cherie called in for prayer this morning as well. Cherie Laurent said to pray for her and the family. And uh, they're not with us, but they're with us in spirit this morning as the people of God. We pray for world peace. We pray for our United States government and all of its internal conflicts and flux that are happening. But God is able. We're still a nation that says in God we trust. Amen. And we will stand on that as the people of God. We turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, heaven and earth, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lord, we praise and thank you that we have this wonderful opportunity at any time of the day or the night, to just open our hearts and open our mouths before you and know that you hear us and that you will answer us as your sons and daughters. We praise and thank you for this mission work you have given to us, for this blessed gift of transforming lives with the good news of the gospel. We thank you, Lord God, that you see something worth in us that you can use to fulfill your mission through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, coming. Continue to empower us with the gifts and, that we need as we share freely our time, our talents, and our treasures, Lord God, to be sure that others may know you as we do and have the promise of heaven as their eternal home. Lord, in thy mercy. Lord, we lift up to you, Lord God, our children in the classroom, whether they're in preschool or graduate school, Lord God, that you will bless them during this academic year. Remind them, Lord God, that you are preparing them for something great for their future, Lord, as you're shaping them and molding them. Be with their teachers and their professors, Lord God, who are committed to the task of pouring this wonderful information into their hearts, into their minds, Lord God, that they may serve you, Lord, faithfully with all that they will learn in the future. Lord, in thy mercy. Lord, we praise and thank you that we're citizens of this United States and citizens of heaven. And Lord, may we use our heavenly citizenship to impact this nation, Lord God, in which we're in, that others may know you as the Lord and Savior and King of their life. We ask, Lord God, your blessings upon all those in public office, that you would guide their hearts and their minds, Lord God, toward righteousness and holiness, and we be reminded that we're a nation who has said, in God we trust and we stand upon you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer, to carry us through this turbulent time in our nation that we may truly represent you as we should as the people who have been saved by you, our Lord and Savior and King. Lord, in thy mercy, Lord, we pray for the lives that have been lost around the world this morning in the midst of the wars. We pray for peace. We pray, Lord God, that your spirit would intervene, Lord, and resolutions may be met and people may stand and realize that there's only one people. You have created us, Lord God, in your image. And we are to respect and to love each other as you have called us to do. Lord, in thy mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we, we thank and praise you, Heavenly Father, for the members that you have called out of this life. Yes, our hearts are heavy. Yes, there are tears flowing from our eyes, Lord God. And, and yes, our hearts may be burdened in their, for their absence. But we thank you, Lord God, for the life of Gerald Gardner. We thank you, Lord God, for the life of Mildred Bledsoe. We thank you, Lord God, for the life of Joyce Whitaker. And we ask, Lord God, for that peace that surpasses all our human understanding to be with the family members, Lord God, and with us as a church family as you grieve but with hope. Lord, in thy mercy. We ask, Lord God, your blessings, Heavenly Father, and our sick and our shut-in. Continue to remind them that you're with them always, even to the end of the age. And there's nothing that you cannot do, Lord God, and all things are truly possible through you. Their rock and their redeemer. Bless, Lord God, James and Janet and, and uh, Janice, Lord God. Continue to bless Melba and our sister Rhonda. Continue to bless Dennis, Lord God, and Elizabeth and Carol. Continue to bless Joyce, Heavenly Father who is celebrating a birthday today. That is <clears throat> Joyce Norfleet, Lord God, and she's home ill today as well. Lord, we also blessings on Rosalind Miles and on Donnelly Phillips, Lord God. 
We thank you, Lord, for your healing blessing you have with Jean's sister and giving Jean the strength to go on. We thank you for the praise you poured, Lord, we've received on Ada this morning, Lord God, and being with her and blessing her and strengthening her in her journey of faith. Lord, in thy mercy, Lord, we continue to ask you to lead God and direct us, and we see another miracle before our eyes this morning, Lord God. You brought to us a young man all the way out of the country of Haiti, Lord God, to serve alongside us in ministry. We thank you for Johnny Nock Burbage, Lord God, for his uh, tenacity, determination, for his faithfulness, Lord God, to you, for him being an example of what it means, Lord God, to come from nothing and be able to serve you, Lord God, with all his gifts and his talents because he's willing and he's persistent that you will use him as a servant for your church. Bless his commissioning this morning, Lord God, that we may see you at work in our lives as you mold and shape him for greater things for your kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. We ask, Lord God, your blessings upon our visitors this morning, Lord, and in the midst of travel. Lord, we ask your blessings on Kim and Anne, Lord God, that whatever they're doing here, Lord God, may be blessed and that they may be returned safely to their homes. Lord, in thy mercy. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise him this morning, number 43, come by here. Singing, Lord, come by here. Some 
first to join me down here. I invite our deacons and elders to join me up here, if you would, at this time, please. That would be a blessing. It was a horrible earthquake in the country of Haiti, kind of like the one here in California. It was called a North Ridge. Is that right? North Ridge earthquake, right? Remember how devastating that earthquake was to the state of California and to surrounding areas? Well, a similar kind of earthquake happened in the country of Haiti in 2010, and I tell you, that earthquake really devastated that country. Haiti is known, as you well know, as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. So to have that kind of poverty and have an earthquake of that magnitude to come in and to impact an already impoverished, shaken place, it was absolutely overwhelming. God in his infinite mercy allowed us to put together a mission team of about 24 missionaries who were willing to go in 2011. You remember that? And we went down to Haiti and were able to work alongside our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Haiti uh, in various places in the country to assist about that much of the devastation that was around us. But our number one responsibility and goal was to bring hope and to let people know that in the midst of your in the midst of your poverty, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all the death around you, God still brings hope. We represented that hope as a team with our brothers and sisters at that time. On that team from the Lutheran Church in Haiti was John Knock Burris. It's amazing what God can do. What God can bring out of the rubble of life to this journey in his life. I had no idea, but here we are today. Amen? Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have come here today to place our hands as a congregation on John Enoch Burris, and we're doing that in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Enoch, you are here today to assist this congregation and the city of Los Angeles in Circuit 6 with the Word and Sacrament Ministry by instructing God's people in his divine and holy word. You are here to prepare yourself for this work by your individual and corporate study of God's word and the faith that drawn from it that you may believe it each and every day of your lives and confess it in the words of the creeds as well as the Evangelical Lutheran Church. While holy life, while holiness of life and work is the way of all we who trust in God, it's especially important that you show yourself by your word and example to be a pattern of good works and good devotion to God every day. In the presence of God and this congregation, I ask you, Enoch, do you accept this office of being a vicar entrusted to you? And do you promise faithfully to carry out all of your duties as a vicar in the Cross-Cultural Ministry Center program entrusted to you? And do you, tr do you commit yourself to conform your life to God's word and according to the faith of the Lutheran Church? If so, answer, I do. We commission you on this day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for this work. Almighty, most merciful God, our Heavenly Father, enlighten and strengthen your servant. May he remain faithful all the days of his life and carry out this task according to your will. Grant, O Lord, to Enoch the gifts and the wisdom and the discretion and the kindness and the faithfulness that is needed so that he may effectively teach and guide us in your word. And grant him, Lord God, all that he needs to be ready to learn that he also prepares himself, Lord, for the office of the holy ministry. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may bless him. We're going to hear more about Enoch's story during our sermon this morning. The tenacity, or another word, persistence, we're going to see in all of our texts today, of the faithful with God and how God answers the faithful when we're persistent in our faith. We're going to hear about that in our sermon this morning. God bless you all. We receive our tithes and our offerings as we sing together, give thanks. <laughs> 
Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks with a holy one. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am strong. because we are thankful to God for all his bountiful blessings and we return to him in obedience our time our talents and our treasures this morning we rise and we sing together thank you Lord Heavenly Father, in obedience to you and your divine, holy, and errant word, we bring our time that you've blessed us with in this world, our uh, talents, Lord God, that you have uniquely shaped us with, and our treasures, Lord God, to your altar this morning, and thanksgiving for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, saving us from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil in our lives, Lord. We want to be obedient servants and passion with your mission. May you, Lord, honor us this morning as we bring it all back to you. In your name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Thank you. Good week. Good morning. The Lord be with you. We begin in the book of Genesis. If you turn to page 49 or 53 in the Bibles in your pews, you will find yourself in the 32nd chapter of that book. Enoch, excuse me, Jacob is going to have a little wrestling match. Actually, Enoch will have a wrestling match, but that comes later. Genesis 32 verses 22 to 30. If you are there and ready, please let me know by saying amen. That night, the scripture says, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jebok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. Then, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed them here. So Jacob called the place Peniel, for he said, 
It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is pretty appropriate because it is an older pastor telling a younger pastor what he needs to do. If you turn to page 1853 or 55, you'll find yourself in the middle of 2 Timothy, the third chapter. This is Paul writing to Timothy, who will later become, or has already become, Bishop of Ephesus, a very important church. But Paul has to make sure he has a very important message in mind. 2 Timothy 3, from verse 10 of that chapter to verse 5 of chapter 4. And if you are ready to hear the word, please say amen. This is Paul's charge. You, therefore, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise through salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will no longer put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to seat their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. In honor of the gospel, we ask anyone who can please rise and turn your Bible into the gospel of Luke. Chapter 18, we will read the eight, first eight verses. And page 16, 28. If you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Thank you. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with, her, with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused but finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, 
listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of the Lord. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there it shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. This is my confession and belief. Amen. The peace, Lord, be with you always, saints. And also with you. That peace we share with each other this morning on this beautiful Pentecost Sunday. Bread of life sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king, a carpenter. You are the living word. Bread of life sent down from glory. Many things you were on earth, a holy king. You are the living word, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer, God with us, the living truth, and what a friend we have in you. You are the living word, awesome ruler, gentle redeemer. God with us, the living truth, and what a friend we have in you. You are the living word, Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you. Manger born, but on a tree, you died to save humanity. You are the living word. 
Jesus, Jesus, that's what we call you. Manger born, but on a tree, you died to save humanity. You are the living word. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. Living word, whoa, 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 that your word is divine, that your word is leading and guiding and directing us every day in righteousness and holiness, that your word is a light for our daily paths every day as we walk by faith and not by sight, that your word is creating in us something great every day, Lord God, for the sake of your kingdom. And we thank you for the assurance of our salvation and our baptismal faith, Lord God, that as we continue to journey with you and fulfill the great commission, God, the great things will happen for the sake of your kingdom. And we praise you for the miracles, Lord God, that we see in your word and for the miracles that we experience in our own lives and for the miracle, Lord God, we're seeing this morning in your servant, Jean Enoch Burris. Bless us, Lord God, so that we may be examples of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Kevin, for blessing us this morning. We're going to get a chance to know our vicar better this morning as he tells his journey. Uh, Enoch grew up at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It's in the area of town like living in historic West Adams. Good Shepherd would be in an area called Caraday. Okay, in case you're going to take a trip sometime soon, I'm going to be sure you get to the right church in the right area, all right? You know, where are you going? Historic West Adams, right, in Los Angeles. There, it's uh, in the city of Port-au-Prince in the area of Caraday, and it's one of our first Lutheran churches that we actually built there. You all know our friend Paul Klenner, who comes to church here, right? Paul Klenner was instrumental in building the church and the school there at Port-au-Prince, leading us as uh, missionaries to be sure that we would plant a church in all of the major cities throughout the country, and then using the daughter, um, the daughter, uh, mother-daughter church planting model to then plant more schools, more orphanages, and things like that, senior homes, uh, as throughout the entire nation. We started that work, and we were able to be successful. We have a major church in every city now. That vision we, we got back in 1998, and that vision now has morphed and become what it is today as a beautiful church body, such a church body, to our Lutheran Church, Missouri Center. It's a blessing to be able to do that. But it was in the earthquake. I was taking teams down, and it was when the earthquake happened when I was actually here. I started mission trips in 1998. But the trip that we took from Los Angeles with people coming literally from all over the United States, many of our members coming from the Christ Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, and from Holy Savior Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska, who joined us on that trip, we went down, as I shared earlier, just to be hands and feet at the heart of Jesus after that devastating 2010 earthquake. And it was then that, that his pastor, Pastor Thomas Bernard, selected him to be on the Haitian part of the team. So we probably had around 30, 35 people when it came down to it because we had our Haitian people and we had our United States people on this team. And we were one of many teams that came down that our brothers and sisters in the Lutheran Church in Haiti were bringing then their members from our churches to come together with the power of the gospel and just go out and to do whatever the assignment was. Sometimes it was clearing rubble. Sometimes it was just uh, doing a medical triage. Sometimes it was uh, doing a vacation Bible school model with the children who could no longer go to school. 
Whatever the assignment was, the pastors of our church there told us, well, this is what's needed right now, and this is what's available over here. And as short-term missionaries, we say yes, and we go, and we did it, and it was a wonderful thing. Enoch happened to be on our team from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, and the team members that were from Concordia University in Irvine fell in love with John Enoch Burris, particularly the girls. You know that, right? They fell in love with John Enoch Burris. And when we came back, they said, Pastor, we have to figure out he's got gifts, he's got abilities. Pastor, why can't he go to school with us? And I said, we need about $35,000, and you can make that happen, you know? <laughs> right? Don't tell God what, what he can't do, right? And so that was my joke to them, and here we are today, right? So the reality of it is we went to work, and Concordia University in Irvine was gracious enough to provide an academic scholarship to Enoch, and uh, we know the rest of the story. We gra he graduated his bachelor's degree this past June, and in the midst of getting a bachelor's degree, the theology department came to him and came to me and said, we see the hand of God on your life. He was a, a servant student of the year, is that right? Service of the year, and what year was that? Two years ago? Three years ago, he got a, an award of being the servant student of the year from his classmates, they voted on that. And so we're here today to hear his story. That's, we're gonna go back in time a few years and let him tell us his story. So you know, tell us a little bit about what it's like to grow up in what we call the poorest country. You didn't know that because you were in the country, right? The poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and what it was like to grow up at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Port-au-Prince in the area of Caraday. What was that like? Um, well, Going back there, I can say it was normal, because that's our life, that's how we grew up, and, and uh, until you know something better, that's the normal life for you. And the life was, um, y your parents make sure that in a day, if they can't feed you two times, but once, they will do that anyway. So, in, first of all, sometimes in order to not jeopardize the big meal, or we call, we call it the main meal of the day, we would skip breakfast. And then what would be breakfast? Breakfast would be coffee and bread. And that would be our breakfast. And then later on in the afternoon, we don't take lunch at 12, stuff like that. We wait until 3 or 4 p.m. to have a main meal. And then that would be also to the afternoon, and we don't have anything else. And sometimes they would give us a, I mean, they give us a huge portion based on, it, now it based on you, if you, want to, if you want to eat part of it and then save some for later, or you want to eat all of it, and then later on, you'll be looking at some money who saves some <laughs> later <laughs> in the day. But the good thing, uh, I mean, the thing about it is that, okay, we talk about saving for later, but we don't have fridges, so we just have to save anyway. And then we don't have to heat it up later. We just eat it the way it is. So that's the life. And for us, not to see a different life, that's the normal life for us. But the other blessing that God gave us is that sometimes you don't have breakfast, and then you go to school, you're going to learn on an empty stomach. And then God brought um, to us the Trinity Hope. This group of people had um, um, provided us a meal every day at school. So if we don't have breakfast in the morning, but we have hope that in the middle of the day at 10, we're going to have some food and then so we can be able to um, be up to learn. And then and when we go back home. When you say food, we're talking about hamburgers and french fries and, and um, steaks and no, what, what kind of food are you talking well, about? The food is with rice and beans. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> rice and beans, and also you go back home, rice and beans, and mm -hmm. then we have a type of corn we do also sometimes. That's, that's the mix we do um, at home, and sometimes they give us rice and beans or beans with corn, and that's, that's the style of food we have also. So that's the life. And um, so that's how God provided for us, and we will see our life, even if coming from here, you would say, like, hey, that's a horrible life. But for us, that was, to us, our, um, I would say, normal life. And I think it got sustained us with that. And 
keep us healthy, and that was our life. And what did, what did you do growing up in the church? Growing up in the church at uh, Good Shepherd Church. So good, growing up, it was like, well, first of all, it was going to church, but, I mean, going to school every week. So to go to school, you have to walk. And during the weekend also, asking us to go to church, that was an extra work, and we, do, we didn't want to do it all the time because we want to save our feet because we are walking every day um, to go to school back and forth. And um, the, reason, the way they do it so that we can go to church on Sundays, they said they're going to give us extra points uh, towards our grade at school. So that encourages us, and every um, Sunday we go to church anyway. So that was my thing. Every Sunday I know I have to go to church because I want this extra grade points. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I, as a kid, I didn't know about any spiritual thing. It was just I need that extra uh, point in my class. So that was it. But after I finished high school, the pastor said, so now you don't have to come every week anymore, so now you're going to come regularly on Sundays. And then I accept that. I asked my father. My father was okay with it. And after that, they, I mean, Pastor uh, Thomas saw in me um, the gift of God, so he said, we're going to start using you in the church. So I was, even if I didn't go to school to learn music, I was able to pick up some notes from the guys playing, and then during the week, I was able to play the piano for the service on Wednesday and also for the service on Friday until I was able to play on Sundays also because we have service Wednesday night, Friday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. So, all, so now that would be my time now going to church back and forth, and that's how I help, and after that, they, he saw more in me, and then he said, well, we need somebody to be our, the leader of a youth in a church. And then they voted for me to be, become the president of the youth group, and uh, that was uh, after the earthquake. And also two years after, and a different story came. I had to come here, so that's when I quit that job that they gave me as becoming the president of the youth group. Okay. So, so tell us like when... The um, mission team you're working with, our mission team, uh, tell us what it was like when people were saying to you the possibility of coming to the United States and studying at Concordia University in Irvine. Um, what are some things that were on your heart and your mind? And then, and then when you actually got the I-20, tell us that story a little bit about how that impacted your life about your faith. Um, so. The earthquake happened, and um, my father passed away in the earthquake. So that was a, a big blow, I would say, because I was 100% uh, uh, dependent on him. So whatever he can give, because we, he, he was protective of us, wanted to do the hard work, and then so us, for us, we can go to school. And also... Um, we would not do the hard work he was doing. Even if some, one day I asked, can I go with you, Dad? He said, no, this is hard work. I don't want you to do that. He was a mason, and he didn't want us to do it. So when he passed away, and I didn't know what to do. So when I was working with these people, the, my first time is like my, my pastor over there um, do a little interview with me in English, and he was trying to speak to see if I understand. And then since he said that I understand and I answer back, he said, okay, I got a job for you. I'm, I'm going to put you in the team where you're going to be a translator for the missionary people coming down here. And then the first team I worked with, there was a lady from um, Indiana. She was the one, uh, she had that idea of, I'm going to bring you to the United States. And so that. But for her, that's all she, can, she, could, she could have said, but she didn't have the power to go forward and do the... The, the rest of the work, which, you know, she didn't have the money. But also in 2011, uh, the group of students came from Concordia. They had the same idea also, but they also joined with Pastor, and then Pastor um, knew who to talk to first, God, and then <laughs> the rest of the people. So Pastor went about and did what was supposed to be done in that perspective. And for me to receive the I-20, that was not even the exciting moment for me because sometimes we have the paper, we need the necessary paperwork 
when you go to the embassy, it depends on them. They can say, we're not going to give it to you. So whether you have the paper or not, if they don't give it to you, that's, that's a waste of time. And I have stories. I know a lot of people when they go to the embassy 10 times, 20 times, they never get the visa. And then for me, that was my big fear. OK, I have the paperwork. I have the I-20. When I get there, are they going to give it to me? Because they're going to ask you lots of questions until maybe you might feel feared, and then you, uh, you answer something that's wrong, and then they don't give it to you. But when I get there, they, I presented my papers, and um, they asked me some simple questions, but I gave the answer that I had. And then the lady said, OK, you are qualified for, you know, uh, for, your, for a visa to, go to, to study to the United States. That was a big miracle. And also from there, I, I know that God was part of this operation. That was a big blessing. Yeah. So now, education in Haiti, in terms of the way uh, the education model works in Haiti, is totally opposite. So now you're translating, you're coming into transitioning into a new culture. And what was it like from a faith perspective to have to make the transition from the, from the Haitian style of academics to the United States style? What, what transformed you? What helped you to make that transition? And maybe tell us what the transition is like. Um, I think it was, it was hard because um, in Haiti, we kind of like learn slow. And uh, like, like here in a classroom, a professor can decide to finish a chapter in one day, in two hours. And then for us, a chapter, we can take two weeks before we finish a chapter. So um, to switch to that um, mindset was really um, a struggle for me. But I think one thing that happened that was really helpful is that they had me took some English classes here before I even was able to start college. And that was the best thing, because I was able to understand from there how the colleges here function in terms of learning, in terms of how fast they go. And I think the English class I took, it was, it was only for um, a summer, but it was helpful, because I took two sessions during that time that was helpful to me. And uh, I was really grateful to the professors, and I thank them a lot, because when I get to the actual college classes, and I can see that if I didn't take that English these English classes, I would be able to make it. It was really helpful. So you speak French, Creole, Spanish, English. You've taken Hebrew successfully in college. And now you're in Greek classes. Yes. So I think we would call you a linguist, right? I think we call you a linguist, right? Yeah. God has given you these beautiful gifts of languages in order to be able to reach all kinds of people around the world with the good news of the gospel. Um, what, do you, what do you, as you're studying Greek and you finish Hebrew, what is the Holy Spirit telling you about how God is preparing you for the future, the work he wants you to do with this gift of languages? So one thing um, the professors, when they teach us the, about the languages, um, it's not, they said it's not to go and bold about yourself what you know, but it's to make sure that you can not only take the Bible and read it, but also you can go to the original languages and then see for yourself. Or you can, you can say, OK, I don't like the way they translate that sentence. And then based on your understanding, based on the Holy Spirit, you can be able to um, translate it better way, but not um, in a sense that you're um, um, saying something different. It's just like the phrasing. And um, once you are able to go to the original language, you can even see better. And that mm -hmm. was, the, that was the, the value of it. And then we, we translate a lot in the Bible. And um, I think God wanted me to learn, not only learning theology, but also know the languages, um, the disciples wrote, and also the guys in the Old Testament, um, they wrote the Bible in. So how can you use French, Creole, Spanish, English, um, Greek, and Hebrew to do ministry? How is that going to bless you with the gifts that God has given you? 
Um, one thing I realized is that, um, like on campus, I met with a lot of people from different places, like Chinese, Saudi Arabian, um, people from Italy, people from um, Germany. Um, so what I always do is to try to uh, ask them to teach me how they say some words or sentences in their languages. And then when I try to um, say it, they said, wow, your pronunciation is really good. So that means they said I am able to, I, if I want to learn any languages, um, I can do it based on the way they see um, my pronunciation goes. And I think that would that is the best way because any one of them I talk to, you know, I like to share my story with people. And then whoever, whoever I met and I tell them my story, they'll be like, wow, that's a wonderful story. And then to go back to Haiti and then bring the way I come here and then the way I get the scholarship from the school and then the way pastor and the church been uh, support, supporting me, they said, wow, you are a miracle. And I think from that history or from my story, a lot of people, even if not right away, they want to um, commit themselves to God, but also they can see what God is doing in my life and what God can do also in their lives. From the time I met you, Pastor Thomas, your pastor, Pastor Thomas Bernard, told me that as a little kid coming, because your family was one of the first members of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church yeah. when we built the church there in Port-au-Prince in Caraday, that he saw something special about you in your life. And so he kind of watched you. And then at your graduation back in May, he said you reached expectations way beyond what he would ever imagine, but God could see, he could see that God had his hand in your life even as you came to the school uh, with no shoes on and a little diaper, he said. He kind of made a little joke out of it, right? That, you, that this far, that great, great things have been expected of you. Um, when the graduate school department, uh, the Professor Fluge, Dr. Fluge, came to you before graduating and said to you, I see something good in you. I see something on you. Tell us about that transforming experience where we thought we're on our way back to Haiti, we're about to do something great there in, in Haiti with the education you've already received, and then God uses Professor Fluge to come to you in the theology department of Concordia, and the chaplain, uh, uh, Chaplain Anderson comes as well and says, I don't think God is through with you yet. There's more for you to do. Yes. Tell us about that transforming moment for you. Um. Well, I've seen Dr. Fluge a lot on campus, but I didn't know his ministry until I had to meet him and talk to him. And he told me that he was serving as a missionary in Togo, Africa for over 10 years. So in, in Togo, Africa, they speak French, and then he had to learn the language also so that he can understand the culture and so that he can do the work that God sent him there to do. And that's how we switch from English to French and we have a great conversation. And then now he's back here on campus. He's now the director of the Cross Cultural Ministry Center, which is a CMC. Um, he said, wow, you can be a good candidate for our program. And then I said, really? And he said, you should consider uh, applying. And then this is what we have. And then I scheduled a meeting with him because I know my financial, I don't have anything. And then I went to him, I said, how that gonna uh, work out? He said, well, don't worry about that. We will, we will have some uh, fund we can apply for and um, they might help you half or I don't know how they consider it. And then he said, yeah, you should consider and then talk to your pastor, see how they can do that. And then for me also, I see, wow, um, we had a plan, but God has his own plan. and. Mm -hmm we following his plan and then until now, now I am in the CMC now, still following God's plan, although we had our own plan finishing here and then go serve and back to Haiti, but God has his own plan and we, we are working on it now. Okay, very good, very good. It's a, all of our lessons for this morning, we, we saw that that uh, persistence and determination of Jacob. We, we saw Paul writing to Timothy and reminding Timothy how it's important to be persistent in faith, right? And we saw that the persistence of the woman said, you've got to heal me, I know who you are, right? 
And I can say to you truly that our vicar has been persistent in his faith, growing up in the church and letting the Holy Spirit lead God and direct him. And we have only been a, a short part of his life, and I'm blessed to be a part of his life. So if you would envision, and, and this is our final question, okay? If you would envision what God can really do in the country of Haiti because of how he's shaping you, what do you think that vision would be if you're able to reach the people in Haiti and reach the people um, in the community, even around Los Angeles, who are Haitian or from the Caribbean? What do you envision that could be if, with the gifts that God has given you? Um, well, like, like to this morning we met with this lady. She is Haitian, but she lives in Las Vegas. And she was so happy that um, while I see her, I said, oh, there is a service happening right now, and right there, can you come? And she said, oh, I need to go change. I said, you don't need to change, just, you, you, you just go. And then she was so happy to be part of the service this morning. And I think uh, since, if we are able to connect to all the Haitians around here in Los Angeles because um, I know that there's a huge community of Haitians uh, around here. Um, for me is to gather, I mean, to see if I can meet with them and see um, the plan God, that God has for me to um, um, share the gospel to them. Some of them are Christians or some of them also are not. So if I can have a way, and I can see that God is um, working in me to uh, make a way so I can preach and share the good news to the, uh, the ones who still do not know Christ. And also, as what they're doing now is to um, help their family back in Haiti. And uh, we can not only help them continue doing that, but also um, share to their family, the love of Christ also, and not only um, goods like food or clothes, whatever, but also let them know that whatever they have here is because of God's love, and we can reach more for the kingdom of God. Persistence, determination, faith. It's in the word of God, and it's right here with one of his servants, and we are privileged at St. Paul Lutheran Church to be a part of something that God started many years ago and we have a wonderful opportunity to continue to be a part of his ministry formation and transformation into the office of the holy ministry. Um, the traditional way it works for uh, students is that um, you graduate from college, and if you feel the call, you make the application to one of our two seminaries, one in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and the other one is in St. Louis, Missouri. And we have one in Canada, too, if you like that kind of a snow. And, um, but most people choose not. And, uh, and it's usually, it's a four-year program. You do two years of academics on campus. You do one year as a student, i.e. vicar, uh, under a senior pastor, and then you return to campus, and you finish uh, with um, your final year, and then you graduate. You get a call into the church. You get ordained, and you take that call and, and, and your ordination to your first assignment. And Enoch's situation, actually, because we are unique uh, here on the West Coast at Concordia, Irvine, Concordia Irvine has partnered with Concordia Seminary St. Louis and developed what is called the Cross-Cultural Ministry Center. And able, we are able to do that. In order for that to happen, though, it changes things a little bit. Uh, it's a requirement that he is actually a vicar for four years, maybe five. I've asked him to slow down a little bit because uh, we, we want to maintain the grade point average and we want to maintain the scholarships that are coming in so that they know that um, he's doing his very best. And then uh, at the end of the four years of being a vicar and being a student in class simultaneously, then he becomes a candidate for um, ordination and potentially a call into the Lutheran Church. So it's a little bit different, but kind of somewhat the same. So he'll be our vicar here at St. Paul at Grace. And because I'm the circuit visitor, uh, he will follow me wherever I go. Amen. And so that'll be an absolute blessing. I'm actually going to be his supervisor and approver and that type of thing. So it'll be an absolute blessing. Can I ask Enoch to close us in prayer for this time of our service? Would you? Yes. First in Creole and then in English. Nous disons merci, bon Dieu, pour grâce ou pour façon que vous observez avec un serviteur ou. Et nous demandons que Saint Esprit capable de continuer guider, capable de continuer à faire route ensemble avec moi jusqu'à ce que nous capable de faire travail que vous demandez que vous me faites. 
et pour nous capable et joindre avec tout haïtien qui dans Los Angeles et pour nous connait que où c'est bon Dieu la vie et pour nous prier ensemble pour pays nous Haïti. Thank you Lord Jesus for this um, opportunity that we have this morning to um, be here and to officially enter your work field God. I ask you that you give me your Holy Spirit um, so that I stay in the work that you ask me to do. First of all, to reach out to the people in Los Angeles, especially the one, the Haitians, and also um, so we can reach back to our country, Haiti. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you may have all the rest, give me Jesus. Just about the break of day, just about the break of day, just about the break of day, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you may have all the rest, give me to die oh and when i come to die give me jesus give me jesus give me jesus you may have all the rest give me jesus and when i want to sing then when I want to sing, and when I want to sing, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you may have all the rest, give me So we need is Jesus, amen? We rise as the people of God and prepare our hearts by coming to the altar of the Lord and receive his true, precious body and blood for us. We sing together these words of preparation that reminds us of the victory of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the feast. This is the feast of victory. For our God, hallelujah. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, and blessing, and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God, hallelujah.
Saints of the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this to remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper when giving thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace, Lord, be with you always, saints. Also with you. Welcome to the table of our Lord. Come on, God.
the blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from death. of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit bless our efforts to proclaim the good news of the gospel all the days of our lives in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing together the words of doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Our closing hymn is number 38, soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are... Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. No more crying then, we are going to see the King. No more crying then, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. We are 
going to see the king no more dying there we are going to see the king no more dying there we are going to see the king hallelujah hallelujah i'm going to see the king 